All right, the second pillar is the pillar of organisational plasticity. And the toxic fume that we're dealing with here is the toxic fume of the fear of mistakes. People, when they're under stress, and that can be when pressure's on or it can be when they're very new to a job, uh, but when people are under stress, they often want a very rigid set of guidelines and rules and procedures to follow. They want things to be black and white, a flow chart, a decision-making tree that says, if this, then that. Now, unfortunately, when you're dealing with human beings, it just isn't that tidy. It, we're too complex. There is no decision tree process or flow chart that is going to be a one size fits all. So we need to recognize that every individual comes with their own set of filters, such as we talked about yesterday, and that we need to make reasonable adjustments to enable those individuals to stay well and to recover in the set of filters that are appropriate to them. Now in the Australian workplaces in particular, I can't speak for um, the US or the UK, but in Australian workplaces in particular, I'm aware that we funnel people through a particular filter in order to edify or justify or verify that there is a mental health issue and we need some kind of um, amendments or adjustments to be made to their work schedule. So what's that filter that's most commonly used in workplaces? And the filter that we, as a policy perspective, tend to use is generally that medical filter, isn't it? Because we're expecting people to bring us some kind of medical certificate that um, says, yes, uh, I'll verify this person is dealing with anxiety or dealing with something. So we actually have a process in particularly in Australian work societies where we funnel people to one of the particular filters. So the pillar of organisational plasticity suggests, can we provide, if we're going to have to provide reasonable adjustments to individuals who are dealing with mental health issues, perhaps their work hours become more flexible, they come early and leave early, or they come late and leave late, maybe they're doing a few days working from home. Um, if we can do that for one individual, is that something that we can provide as an option for our entire workforce? Now, in some places, it won't be possible because the work will be something that's done, say, for example, in Brian's team. You physically have to be in the environment to do your job. Um, but in other areas, there can be greater flexibility applied where team members could do those kinds of telecommutes. Now, it's quite interesting that up until this year, when I've said in the past, um, you know, if you can provide reasonable adjustments to um, an impacted member of your team, is it possible to provide that to all members of your team? And everyone would say, no, 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 we can't do that. And then COVID came. And now we've all learned that there is possibility to um, be able to provide effective work from remote locations. But if you are able to provide those adjustments and it has to be reasonable, it has to be relevant to the work environment, <clears throat> flexible adjustments for all team members, then there may reduce the requirement for people to actually have to declare, I have anxiety or I have depression or, or whatever it might be, if those uh, flexible arrangements are available to all. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.